Hello, second years. Welcome to your online lecture for diathermy. I know it seems so weird because I've talked about diathermy a lot, particularly when I was lecturing on therapeutic ultrasound. And now we're finally here. Um, I kind of saved this for the end of the course because it's a clinical tool that we definitely have to talk about, but certainly one that you won't engage with very often in the clinical setting. Yet still, you need to know it, number one, for your board of certification examination. And number two, if in fact you do encounter a diathermy machine in the clinical setting, that you would at least have an idea of what it is and physiologically what it does. So today we're going to focus on diathermy. What we know about diathermy is that it's most commonly used um, for um or in the treatment of muscular and joint associated pains, uh, more particularly in large muscular groups, right? And this is one of the key dif differences between ultrasound and, and diathermy is that diathermy is really capable of heating a larger treatment area, right? We know about therapeutic ultrasound and diathermy together is that they're both the two deep tissue heaters, right? One of the limitations, however, clinically with therapeutic ultrasound is that it just can't heat those large treatment areas. So if you want to heat a large treatment area and you want to travel deeper down to that target tissue, then diathermy is where you want to be living clinically. Again, the odds of you actually encountering it in the clinical setting are, are very rare. So when we define diathermy, I, I like to break down words because it helps me remember things a little bit better. So when we're thinking dia, we're thinking something that goes through something and then thermy obviously means heat. And so we get heat traveling through a source to get to the target tissue. That's diathermy. That's the purpose of diathermy. It's why we apply diathermy to our patients. In terms of its physiological effects, we'll talk about these individually. What we know and what's been reported in the literature is that with application of diathermy, it can improve circulation, it can reduce pain, it can enhance now, notice I said not speed up, but it can enhance the rate of recovery of healing tissue. And we'll talk about all these reasons why, but I didn't say speed up because we can't speed up the healing process. What we can do is improve it. What we can do is facilitate it. But remember, we cannot speed that up, okay? So as we move through and we're talking about the different principles of diathermy, we have to consider the physiological effects that it's capable of um, causing within a tissue that's being stimulated by this particular modality. So what we know about our bodies in particular is that before injury, we have molecules, um, right? Um, in particular, we have these dipolar molecules in the human body that are arranged on the basis of polarity, right? Um, and this arrangement is a homeostatic uh, environment. In, in other words, we have an even amount of, of uh, negative and positive electrodes, and they're all arranged according to their dipolarity, right? What we know about injury, however, is that when a tissue is damaged, those dipoles or the dipolarity distribution, that evenness within the dipolar dipolar distribution gets disrupted. It becomes irregular. It deviates from the normal polarity-based arrangement. So injury disrupts our homeostatic environment. No surprise to you all there. But knowing that we have these dipole molecules and that injury disrupts them becomes important because this is where diathermy works physiologically. It works to restore that dipolar arrangement, that normative arrangement or polarity arrangement within the human body. So how does it work exactly? Under the influence of an electrical field, which we'll talk about and there'll be images you see that if there's an electrical field being applied to those dipoles, they'll rotate according to the polarity um, of the charge in that particular direction, and then they'll rearrange, right? So essentially what we do with diathermy is we apply an electrical modality that um, enhances or restores, for lack of better words, the polarity within our, our tissues, which then leads to, if we were to scroll back up to that slide, it's going to lead to that enhancement in the rate of the recovery of that healing tissue, right? Okay, so what are some of the challenges of, of diathermy? The number one challenge is actually finding a, a clinic that has a diathermy machine. But with that being said, physiologically, what are some of the barriers when we're applying uh, diathermy, right? Can you guys tell I'm kind of excited about this? I don't know why, because you aren't gonna see it very often, but I get excited when I think about diathermy because it truly is a deep tissue here that's capable of heating large treatment areas. I just wish we had access to them. And we'll talk about why we don't in just a second. 
So for point number one, um, as the subcutaneous layer is fatty, um, direct delivery of heat to the deep tissues is, is not possible. So think about this. Let me say it this way. Law of growth is draper, right? This idea that energy absorbed by one layer is not available to be absorbed by the next layer. That's essentially what I'm saying with, with point one. We know that we have to get through the subcutaneous layer. We know that we have to get through the adipose layer, right? Um, and, and that's going to absorb the majority of our diathermy um, energy, but there still is a lot left over to be absorbed by the deeper tissues, right? A lot more than is available when we use a therapeutic ultrasound treatment, which is why it's capable of de being delivered to deeper tissues, right? Okay, one of the concerns with diathermy is this right here, and it's one of the reasons that we don't see it very often uh, in used in the clinical setting anymore, is that it involves uneven and uncontrolled delivery of heat. Um, and so sometimes what we see is not only do we get the target tissues that are being heated, but we also get tissues that we didn't even imagine um, being heated. So those surrounding tissues also get affected. And one of the negative things about this is if we don't want the surrounding tissue to be impacted by this treatment, we have no control over that. So you have to ask yourself, even though I can heat a larger treatment area, do I want everything surrounding that treatment area to also be heated as well? And are there contraindications for that as well, right? So that is one negative effect. The other thing that we know about diathermy is that it's using an electrical current um, and that electrical current, believe it or not, produces heat deep inside of the targeted tissue. And we would call this the process of conversion, right? In ultrasound, it was the ultrasonic energy being um, converted into uh, thermal energy, right? And in this particular case, in diathermy's case, it's a, an electrical current being converted into thermal energy, right? We know about uh, diathermy is that it can it can reach areas as as deep as uh, two inches from the skin surface. So certainly capable of getting down to the muscular layer. Um, and so what do we know about diathermy, the machine itself, is that it does not apply heat directly to the body. It's indirectly through the process of conversion. Or, does that make sense, you guys? So that electrical energy as it's penetrating uh, causes molecular vibration, which causes an increase in, in heat. Does that make sense, you guys? I hope so. Okay, so as the heat increases, as we see increased molecular uh, vibration, as we start to see the restoration of, of the dipoles, uh, what we also know is that as heat increases, so do we see an increase in, in blood flow, right? There's an increase in vasodilation, which leads to an increase in blood flow. And that blood flow, that increase in blood flow is relatively important, right? We're getting new blood in, we're taking old blood out. We have white blood cells being allowed to go into the area and start the process of phagocytosis if it's necessary, right, you guys? So what we know is that because we see this increase in blood flow, we see this increase in heat, that it improves joint flexibility. So it's one of the reasons that diathermy is used often in patients with osteoarthritis, right? Those patients that are going to have that stiff joint or have a hard time moving that joint in and out of flexion or extension because of the arthritic um the arthritic tendencies and the increase in painful impulses. So it's really good at reducing joint stiffness, which leads secondarily to a reduction in pain and an improvement in quality of life of those patients with osteoarthritis. So what are some of the benefits of diathermy, right? Um, number one, we know that there's this intense heat being delivered um, and that intense heat leads to re a, a reduction in pain relief and an improvement in flexibility about the joint or about the muscle or about the tendon. And you guys might say, well, how does heat reduce pain? Well, similarly um, to the ways that it does that with thermal modalities and with ultrasound, right? Uh, reduction in pain. A, redu a reduction in spasm, which leads to a reduction in pain, is the number one way that it's going to do that physiologically speaking. We know that it also can reduce inflammation. Again, how does that happen, right? Uh, we have this increased blood flow, which is bringing in uh, white blood cells, right? And so we get that process of phagocytosis, those white blood cells infiltrating that injured area, starting the process of phagocytosis. Uh, so that's one of the ways that we kind of clear inflammation through the use of diathermy. We know that it improves circulation um, and accelerates healing. Man, I wish I could take that term back. I would say it, it, it enhances healing through the process of reducing pain, reducing um, spasm, improving joint flexibility, reducing inflammation, and improving circulation about a joint or a muscular tissue. 
So there are many types of diathermies um, on the market. The one that we most often use and, and the one that we will discuss for the remainder of this particular lecture is shortwave diathermy. It's the one that athletic trainers are allowed to use. And so it's the one that we'll focus on in terms of its physiological effects uh, within the human body. But there certainly is long wave diathermy, microwave diathermy, ultrasound diathermy, and laser diathermy, all of which we as athletic trainers typically do not use and have not been approved to use in the United States. So in terms of shortwave diathermy, it's a modality that produces deep heating um, via the process of conversion, right? So we have this electromagnetic energy that's being produced by the diathermy machine that gets converted into thermal energy within the actual tissues. I think that that makes sense now that we understand therapeutic ultrasound. Um, and the pattern of heat and the type of heat and the intensity of heat produced by a diathermy is going to depend on um, three different factors. Number one, the frequency that we, we select for the actual treatment, the type of shortwave diathermy unit. So one of the things that um, is really hard to control with a shortwave diathermy unit is that we are limited by the manufacturer settings, right? So we can only deliver as high of a voltage or a, as high of an electromagnetic energy as is determined by the manufacturer. So this is going to vary a lot. Same thing, the frequency is going to vary a lot based on the type of unit that you purchase within the clinical setting. But then last but not least is the water content of the tissues, right? Well, we know about tissues that are high in, in water content is that they actually transfer uh, diet, uh, electromagnetic energy relatively well. So we want tissues high in water content, i.e. the muscles and absorb all of that uh, electromagnetic energy, convert it into thermal energy, and we'll get that treatment effect that we see with uh, shortwave diathermy. So in terms of the parameters that we will set um, when we're working with a shortwave diathermy device. Uh, number one, what we know about the current frequency is it's in the megahertz spectrum. Does that make sense, you guys? Similar to therapeutic ultrasound, right? These waves, these electromagnetic waves, right, are then converted into thermal energy. So we can have a shortwave diathermy current frequency of between 10 and 100 megahertz. Now, I wanna say this clearly, that this is all going to be dependent on the actual manufacturer, the device that you actually decide to, to purchase. What we know most often though in the field of athletic training or in uh, physical therapy, the frequency most commonly utilized is a, 2 point, a 27 megahertz treatment, right? You wanna put the one, two on there, that's fine, but about 27 megahertz. Um, and then in terms of its, if its wavelength, um, we're looking at about 11 meters, right? Um, so these are things that you'll have to manipulate when you actually work with the device itself. So we know about, um, uh, shortwave diathermy is that it can be continuous or it can be pulsed. Does that remind you of something, you guys? Remind you of therapeutic ultrasound a little bit? Yes, so your continuous treatment, right, is going to be very thermal driven, right? And your pulse treatment certainly can be thermal, but most often it's used for its non-thermal effects. So think back to therapeutic ultrasound and think about those non-thermal effects, right? The micro streaming, the micro bubbles, the eddy of the eddies of water, right? So we're thinking about all of these and we're thinking about enhancement of the healing process, protein synthesis, right? So we have this pulsed shortwave diathermy PSWD, or we just have shortwave diathermy, which is considered continuous diathermy, right? One of the great things about uh, pulsed shortwave diathermy is that obviously the patient isn't receiving all of the electromagnetic waves, right? Um, and so that patient essentially receives a lower dose of shortwave diathermy energy when compared to that continuous, right? So it means we're heating the tissues less, um, but then we also uh, have less of a risk of heating the tissues outside of the actual treatment area. What I will say overall in general, most often in the clinical setting, it, we typically will use the pulse shortwave diathermy as opposed to the continuous because there's just so much heat um, being applied or converted within the actual tissues that we can actually cause tissue damage, okay? So shortwave diathermy uh, can produce deep and superficial tissue heating. 
under certain controlled environments. But the goal, really the reason that we use shortwave diathermy probably most often is those deep tissues and those larger treatment areas. Does that make sense, you guys? Larger treatment areas, deep tissues that maybe therapeutic ultrasound just can't penetrate. Most often it's going to be applied for 20 minutes um, at max. And then you want to figure out what the tolerable dose is for that particular patient. Unlike therapeutic ultrasound, your patient will feel the heating that occurs with a shortwave diathermy treatment. So it becomes important to figure out if we're doing a 20 minute treatment, we need to make sure it's tolerable for that patient. Now, some of you guys have done like um, the tanning beds um, and I haven't. Okay. But if you have, then um, you recognize that sometimes you do feel like a burn with those, with those tanning beds. Tanning beds are typically like, um, they're like a shortwave diathermy, right? A larger shortwave diathermy, but certainly they are capable of baking the skin, burning the skin, just as shortwave diathermy is. So we have to be very careful. I think one major difference between a shortwave diathermy treatment and a therapeutic ultrasound treatment is what you're seeing here. It's the treatment length, right? We never do an ultrasound for 20 minutes. There's just no way. The cool thing about diathermy is you can actually set this up and leave your patient. You don't have to sit there with a wand and rub your patient's skin for um, a long treatment time. So about 20 minutes is considered the standard treatment for a shortwave diathermy. Now within diather shortwave diathermy, there are two different types of treatment. There's the induction field and the capacitive field. We're going to talk about the induction field first, but do know that typically we don't use this type of treatment. So I'm going to Talk about it because you need to know it for your exam, but certainly not the one that we would use most often in the clinical setting. Um, so with an induction field diathermy, uh, essentially what happens is you are placing that patient or that patient's limb in the actual electric electromagnetic field. So we can see that here, right? You are essentially wrapping these cables around the injured area and creating that electromagnetic field, right? Uh, and so what we see here is that the current or that electromagnetic energy is going to be flowing within those actual coils. Does everybody see that? And then it creates this rotating magnetic field, which essentially will, will restore your, your dipolar arrangement. Does that make sense, you guys? I hope so, right? I know it's kind of hard to visualize, but this is exactly what it looks like. It's hooked up to a uh, electromagnetic box. You're going to have some kind of like um, electromagnetic magnetic uh, padding and then the coils will wrap around that to protect the patient right in other words we don't want to apply the coils directly to the patient and so we get this kind of electromagnetic field going as we turn on that energy uh, and so we can see we have eddies of currents flowing through the patient's injured area with the goal to restore um, homeostasis within that injured area does that make sense you guys now, just like with microstreaming and ultrasound, what we'll see is those currents cause the movement of the molecules and we create molecular vibration. And that's what's responsible for what we would call actual heating. Does that make sense? Of the target tissues. I think that makes sense because you understand uh, non-thermal ultrasound. For capacitive uh, field diathermy, this is the one we use most often. Uh, this is the opposite of inductive inductance um, filled diathermy. So with this particular um, setup, what you're going to do is use the patient's tissue as a part of the circuit. So instead of direct contact with the diathermy machine, you can see that it's sitting up about, give or take three to six inches away from the actual patient's skin. And so we have these things called capacitive plates that are for the most part metal. I've seen some plastic ones, but we have these metal plates that sit just above the, the patient's skin. Most often they have to surround that skin. Does that make sense? So either anterior, posterior, or medial lateral positions, but you have to create um, an electric field, right? Essentially, right? So the tissues, uh, electrical resistance produces the heat. So in essence, what we get is instead of like molecular vibration, what you get is this resistance from the electricity, which creates the actual heat within the actual patient itself. Um, one of the things that we see in this particular case is that that muscle um, is being heated via conduction um, from the actual adipose tissue. So that adipose tissue is absorbing a lot of the a lot of the um, diathermic energy and that heat from the adipose tissue is actually traveling down 
to the target tissues, right? So it's a little bit different. We're not getting the heat from molecular vibration as we did with the inductive field. We're getting it a little bit different. Heat is traveling down through the different tissue layers. Most of it's being trapped in that adipose tissue. Um, and then the cool thing is you have the adipose tissue. It's so hot that that heat then just drops down into the lower la layer, which would be the muscle layer of the of the body. So there are different types of electrodes. Some of them here, you can see uh, number one, this is kind of like that rubber uh, 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 electrode, um, but you can see that on the inside of that, like right in here, there is a metal, right? And that metal is encased within the protective covering. And then you have um, this little guy here, which is kind of like the equivalent of, oh, I'm blanking you guys. The pad that we put on our hydroculator, right? Um, or, or the the pad from the hydroculator, right? So it's another protective uh, casing so that we don't burn our patients if we are actually applying the inductive portion of, of shortwave diathermy. We have these space plates. Can you guys see that here, right? So this is going to be for the capacitive form of shortwave diathermy. So imagine putting like a foot or a leg in between those, those plates. The cool thing is you can, um, uh, adjust the width of these or the height of these or the length of these. Um, so they're really cool. Again, you're creating kind of this um, current for the for the current to flow within the actual muscles. Remember, it's going to get trapped by the adipose tissue layer. Adipose tissue layer is going to get really hot and that heat is going to travel down to the uh, muscular layer if that is the target or the goal of your, your treatment. The coil method is, is really common for the inductive shortwave diathermy. So you can see that here. Essentially what you have um, is an electromagnetic kind of pad wrapped in a coil. Um, and so that coil is then hooked up to the shortwave diathermy device. Um, and so what you have is diathermy being directly, um, uh, what am I thinking? Directly transmitted to the patient through direct touch, right? So there's direct touch with the diathermy and the patient. Again, most often in, in the field of athletic training, we are going to be using the capacitive method, the method where we're not touching, where the electrodes are sitting about three to six inches away from the patient's skin. We know about the COIL method is that there's an increased risk rate um, for, for burns. And so that's one of the reasons that I don't recommend the COIL method, but certainly one that can be utilized. We have the, the monode method. Um, this is the one that when I was practicing clinically probably was the most common. Um, this might look very similar. Essentially, we have this kind of metal coil which actually will heat up, right? So think about like the burners on a stove. You've seen those electric stoves. Think of, think of the monode method as this way. Again, just like with the metal um, electrodes that we just saw, this will sit about three to six inches away from the patient and deliver diathermic energy. So again, another capacitive way to deliver um, uh, diathermy to our actual patient. One of the things that's uh, new, um, as we see new diathermy devices, is the diplode method um, or the drum method. So what we can see here is this is a larger device, a larger device that consists of a flat coil electrode kind of encased within this actual um, cover, right? The cool thing is that if you bend these wings down, you can treat like an entire quad or hamstring muscle and it and that energy is going to be delivered over three different places the central portion and the lateral and medial portions of that particular muscle so you can get a larger treatment area with this diploid diploid method again a compass a capacitive method this isn't going to touch the patient's skin right we would cause burns it's going to be about three to six inches away from the patient's skin Okay, so factors that influence uh, treatment with shortwave diathermy. So spacing is going to be one of them, right? Um, this allows the lines of force in the electromagnetic field to diverge before entering the tissue. So we want some space, right? We want some space from the patient. In other words, we want the diathermy to be sitting about three to six inches away from the injured area because that creates divergence. And we know that divergence, right, means that the electromagnetic energy is going to spread and cover more of what, you guys? 
the larger treatment area, right? It's one of the differentials for, for shortwave diathermy and ultrasound. So we wanna make sure if we're using the capacitive method that we have some spacing between the actual diathermy and, and the patient so we can get that, divergent, that divergence that's going to actually happen. Now, there are many ways to get spacing in a treatment. Uh, one way to do that is to wrap the flexible pads in a towel. Does that make sense? So if we go back up to um, this scenario, where are we? Sorry, guys, for the scroll. This scenario here where we see towels, we could put multiple layers of towels to create the spacing for the quill that's laying on the towel. That's one way to create spacing. Does that make sense? Wanted to give you a visual. Uh, other ways that we can create spacing is air. So if we, in, in this particular setup, let's go here, right? As long as there's a space between these plates, then we're also creating a space, right? So there are natural ways to do that and there are clinical ways to do that. You have to pick your poison based on which diathermy machine you actually have in the clinical setting. Um, what we know about normal spacing is, is, is it's, uh, it's going to even the field of distribution, which is great. We want even electro, uh, electromagnetic energy to be delivered to our patient. It's when we don't have normal spacing, right, that we get these uneven fields of distribution and we, it leads to spikes in burning um, or uncomfortability in patient treatment, treatment right? Okay. What we also know is that um, increasing spacing, so as we increase the amount of space between the diathermy machine and the, the treatment area, we get deeper penetration, right? Does that make sense? I think that makes sense, right, you guys? Because in electrical modalities, the further the pads are away, what happens? The deeper the electricity is allowed to travel. Guess what? Decreased spacing between the diathermy machine and the patient leads to superficial concentration. So we'll be heating the superficial tissues, just like with a, um, the electric, modality segment, right? Where we talked about pads that are closer together, the electricity isn't going to penetrate as deep. So these concepts are kind of similar across different devices um, and different modalities. Are you guys seeing this? I hope so, because I'm getting excited talking about it. All right, the next thing that we have to consider is the electrode sides, size. Um, if the electrodes are too small, um, then the diameter of the treated part um, will be concentrated superficially. So smaller electrodes, um, because the electromagnetic energy just can't escape, will typically be used to treat superficial areas, right? Um, if they're if they're way too large, then you lose a lot of the diathermy to the actual air because they diverge and they just get lost in the atmosphere. Does that make sense? So what we want, the ideal would be that the electrodes are just slightly larger than the treatment area. Does that make sense, you guys? If it's too small, then you just get superficial treatment. If it's way too large, some of those electrodes are lost to the environment. So we have to find an electrode that's just larger than the treatment area to maximize the physiological effects of diathermy. To concentrate on one aspect um, of the part, so if you want to focus on one specific area when you're using diathermy, right, the electrodes should be of unequal size. Does that make sense? So with the smaller one, does this make sense? Because it's going to diverge more. With the smaller one being placed over the area where you actually want to focus, and then the larger one either being placed proximally or, or distally. Does that make sense, you guys? Now, this setup assumes that we have either those flexible rubber pads, right, or we're using the, the, the coil method, right? Um, so what I also know about diathermy is that you can produce um, concentration of heat by using equal sizes of electrodes, um, but unequal spacing. Does that make sense? So you'll have to either do something like um, place something 25 millimeters over concentrated area um, and more than 30 millimeters on the other electrode away from that site. Does that make sense? So you can do it either by one of two ways, changing the size of the electrode or changing the distance of the electrode so that one of them, right, is over the concentrated area or very near to that concentrated area and the other one is a further away from the, the actual desired treatment area. So this is just a repeat of what I've already been saying, you guys, um, but I love images and I think you guys do too. And so when we're thinking about um, spacing, if spacing is less than about 25 millimeters, then we know that between the electrodes, then we know that that treatment is going to be very superficial. It's going to target superficial tissues. And there might be... Um, 
times in the clinical setting where you want your diathermy to focus on superficial tissues, right? If spacing increases, then what we know is that you get more depth or uh, deeper uh, penetration of the actual electromagnetic energy. And so thus you get thermal energy that's driven deeper. Um, so it's important to think about those two concepts. Do we want superficial treatment or do we want a deep treatment? Because that's going to drive where you place those electrodes in that particular treatment setting. The most common treatments um, that we will see in the clinical setting, we're going to kind of talk through the application of those now so you know how to set it up since we don't physically have a diathermy machine. The first one is the coil electric uh, electrode method. Remember, you're going to have some sort of a sleeve um, that you're going to wrap around the patient and then you're going to wrap that coil um, around the injured area firmly and evenly. So you want it to be tight, not tight and so tight that it cuts off circulation. So that's one, this is the coil method. The other one is the pancake application um, as most call it, probably not clinically savvy, but you'll remember it, right? So when we think about the pancake method, most often used in low back pain patients, You'll see that there is a towel or a pad down. Again, remember to increase distance, just add more towels or more pads. Um, and then what you see here is kind of like a pancake. You take that coil and you just wrap it in a circular motion around the, around the injured spot. So this is one way to use shortwave diathermy depending on what devices or what extensions you have available to you. The other way to utilize it is using the diploid method, which again, I like the most because it's more joint specific, which is awesome. You can see here in this low back pain patient, you have the diploid method. So you have that central slip and you have the lateral and lateral slip there. But cool thing here, like let's say that's an AC joint, you're getting both the scap, you're getting the clavicle and you're actually getting that AC joint as well. Again, you could probably get deep into the, um, the rotator cuff muscles with the diploid method. The cool thing is that these wings, they call them wings, are extremely flexible. So again, it gives you flexibility and treatment. These are the two most common. There certainly are other treatment um, applications within the field of diathermy, but these are the probably the two most common types of treatments that you'll be setting your patients up on, particularly if you're going into the field of physical therapy. So onward towards the physiological effects, I've kind of talked about them as I've moved or progressed through this PowerPoint, um, but I think it's important to spend a little bit of time here to make sure that we're all on the same page. When we apply the, uh, diathermy to a patient in the clinical setting, we have to understand what physiological effects can actually happen. We know that diathermy is most often going to produce some type of heat in the tissue, right? Even if it's pulsed, we're probably still going to get some type of heat um, with that particular treatment. One of the number one physiological effects that we see clinically and physiologically um, in patients who have used diathermy is increased metabolism, right? Increased cellular metabolism to be exact. So one of the things that we don't want to do is we don't want to apply shortwave diathermy in the acute phase of the injury because it's going to increase the tissue's need for oxygen. And in the acute phase, we just don't have the ability to accommodate that need. But as we progress into the proliferation phase and the maturation phase, we actually want this increased cellular metabolism, right? We want the cells to be working and regenerating and working over time to, to heal itself. Um, but one of the cool things about increased cellular metabolism is that there will be uh, increased output of waste products. So what do I mean by that? The increased removal of waste products within the injured area, which again is going to do what? It's going to enhance the healing process, right? The other thing that we know that diathermy does when we apply it to a patient is it's going to increase um, a blood flow, right? Um, and this is kind of as a result of increased output of waste products uh, such as metabolites. And so this increased blood flow is what's going to be responsible for doing what? It's going to be responsible for removing those waste products out of the injured area uh, and, and make way for what? New products such as the white blood cells that will come in and cause phag phagocytosis, right? Are you guys seeing that? So we get this increased blood flow to the area most often as a result of vasodilation, right? Dilation, not dilatation, okay? Um, and so in terms of heat and what it does um, at the nerve endings is we know that it's going to stimulate the A-beta, so like it's just gate kind of cycle, um, and it's going to close the gate to pain most often, if, especially if it's touching the patient, so we get a reduction in pain. But what we also know is that at least what's been reported, maybe not necessarily proven, is that it does increase nerve conduction velocity, um, which a lot of times can be a good thing. It's going to turn on the feedback loop and give the patient feedback about what it's receiving, what 
he or she is receiving in that particular environment. We know that we're going to have a rise in the, the tissue temperature, number one, because of increased cellular metabolism, number two, because of increased blood flow to, to the area. What we know about this increase in tissue temperature is that it causes muscle relaxation um, and it increases the efficiency of muscle action. So in essence, if we have re reduction in, in, in spasm or relaxation, then essentially what we get is a reduction in pain, right? We talked about pain earlier on but it's in this process that we're raising the temperature, it causes muscle relaxation, which essentially leads to a reduction in, in pain and muscular efficiency. Um, one of the scary things about diathermy, because it is capable of, of treating a large treatment area because it can impact tissue surrounding it, is we've actually seen a reduction in, in blood pressure um, and so this has to do with number one, the increase in vasodilation, which essentially reduces peripheral resistance to blood flow. Um, and essentially what we know is that um, it also reduces blood viscosity. And so that helps reduce blood pressure. So we've seen sometimes in, in the event that we're treating patients with hypertension, that in fact, this has been somewhat beneficial, not very temporarily beneficial, but certainly beneficial to reducing blood pressure in those with hypertension. Listen to me, I am not saying use this as a treatment for those with hypertension, but you certainly could expect positive results if you have a patient who is injured and has hypertension. But on the opposite end of that spectrum, I, I, I say this as a warning that if we have a hypotensive patient, that one of the things that we could concern us is that their blood pressure would fall so much that they might faint. So this is a question that we ask our patients, a historical question that we're asking our patients before we actually apply the, the diathermy to our patients. So how does diathermy actually affect inflammation? Uh, we've kind of talked about it. Uh, the big key is going to be the vasodilation, not in the acute phase, right? Um, one of the things that we see is this removal of the waste products, this facilitation of the removal of, of the, the waste products, right? We bring in O2, we bring in those white blood cells, which I've mentioned over and over again. These three kind of factors essentially lead to what? The resolution of inflammation, increased vasodilation, infiltration of O2 and the white blood cells all lead to the reduction of, of inflammation over time. So using... Um, diathermy to me is really advantageous to um, not only just reducing inflammation and reducing um, or improving muscle efficiency and, and causing muscle relaxation, but certainly when we're really thinking about this overall, it seems to be extremely beneficial to the healing process when we're thinking of our, our patients. One of the cool things that we're learning about is um, how does diathermy actually have an effect on a bacterial infection? So when I'm thinking about um, in the field of athletic training, we see a lot of uh, boils, carbuncles, and abscesses, which we talked about in the summer in our general medicine course. Remember that? Um, one of the cool things is that we know is uh, diathermy will reduce inflammation, right? Uh, we know that inflammation is the body's normal response to a bacterial infection. So it's going to reduce the inflammation around or surrounding that particular uh, bacterial infection. A lot of times with these boils and carbuncles and abscesses, a physician will say actually heat it, right? And so in this case, we can use diathermy as a way to deeply heat and kind of surround that bacterial infection and push it to a head um, and, and get that bacterial uh, infection out of the actual body itself. So diathermy, very uh, localized diathermy has been used to reduce um, or improve um, healing from bacterial infection, particularly when we're talking about those boils, carbuncles, and abscesses. All right, so how does it enhance healing? How does it reduce healing time? In quotation marks, you guys can see me doing my air quotations. Um, there's increased blood supply. We get rid of all of the waste within the actual location and then we get o2 coming into the area these are all all three of these are positive ways in which we enhance healing improve healing over time for our patients right we're creating a positive healing environment one in which we are um, ridding the area of waste or byproducts that would increase the inflammatory response right you guys are you seeing that are you wrapping your head around that i hope so all right um, and then finally, the relief of pain, right? Uh, number one, there's that sedative relaxation muscular effect. Um, and so as a result, pain spasm, pain cycle, right? The removal of waste products, the resolution of inflammation because we have O2 going into the area, those white blood cells coming into the area. Um, and, in, and some patients would say, um, 
and and some physiologists would say a counter irritation occurs so we heat the area it causes a little bit of pain and so it takes the 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 brain's uh cognitive awareness away from the area that's actually injured so it's a counter irritation kind of like tiger bomb etc i will say this hasn't been used very often in the field of athletic training most often the relief of pain comes from these top three bullet points all right, effect on muscle tissue. Uh, there's two ways in which it does that. It causes muscle relaxation, number one. And then number two, as a result of muscle relaxation, it causes a reduction in muscle spasm, which then again, reduces the amount of pain. So what are some uses for um, diathermy? Muscular skeletal disorders are the key prime use for um, athletic trainers, at least, or at least in the field of athletic training. We've certainly see, seen it be used most often for degenerative joint disorders, such as osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, because it's going to reduce that joint stiffness. The other thing I like that we saw a few slides above is that it can surround the actual joint with that dipole method, right? Um, and so we get a reduction in the signs and symptoms that our patients are reporting to us with degenerative joint disorders. And that excites me. It's also been used to uh, assist with sprains and strains, resolution of, of hematoma. Again, that really has to do with removal of the waste products and increase or an influx in, in, in O2. Um, muscle and tendon tears because of the increased blood flow and the enhancement in the healing process and capsular lesions for the same reason as de degenerative joint disorders. In terms of inflammatory conditions, most often we've seen it used in the clinical setting for boils and carbuncles, um, but we've also seen it being used to treat pelvic conditions. So um, like PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, again, outside the scope of athletic training, but certainly reasons that we could see, that we would see the use of diathermy, at least in the field of athletic training. Um, and then dangers. The biggest thing, and this is what we're going to end on, is the danger slide. Uh, number one, number one, number one, number one, is when you're setting up diathermy, you want to make sure that you do not burn the patient, right? So want to make sure if it's a metal electrode that the metal isn't touching the patient. Put a pad down, put, um, put a pad down, put a towel down, put something down so that we the metal isn't actually burning the patient. We have to be careful of those that have impaired blood flow. It will increase their risk of burn. And we just wanna make sure that we have the correct parameters, right? I think that's probably what's going to be most key in terms of what we do as athletic trainers. But burning is the number one contraindication or danger. Uh, the other one that I see is that faintness, and that has to do with a patient who is already hypotensive. And remember, we're going to uh, reduce blood pressure even more. So we see the, the faintness or the dizziness that proceeds afterwards. And we don't want to overdose the patient. So by that, we, I mean, we don't want to apply so much electromagnetic energy that we cause tissue damage. So we want to be careful of these things on the list. I know you guys are probably thinking, but you didn't give us any parameters. So I'm gonna try my best to give you parameters, knowing that this isn't something that I use very often in the clinical setting. I can only give you what the science tells me. So in terms of the things that we are going to be able to adjust on a device, there are two things. It's the pulse width and the pulse rate, right? Or the frequency of the treatment. Does that make sense, you guys? So if we want to um, not have any warm, we want a non thermal treatment. So we want to treat acute trauma, acute inflammation, edema, anything in the acute phase, right? Our pulse width should be at about 65 microseconds or U seconds. And our pulse rate is about one to um, 100 to 200 pulses per second. Does that make sense? So anything acute, we want a shorter pulse width and we want a low frequency of treatment, 100 to 200 pulses per second. If we want mild warmth, so we're in the subacute inflammatory phase, uh, most often our pulse width is gonna be a little bit wider, so about 100 to 200 microseconds. And our frequency of treatment is going to be about 800 pulses per second. So there's a crazy jump, right, you guys? For moderate warmth, so anytime we're treating some type of pain syndrome, such as like osteoarthritis, muscle spasm, chronic inflammatory conditions like fibromyalgia, if we want to increase let's say blood flow to an area, 
then what we want is our um, pulse width to be about 200 to 400 microseconds. So we're expanding that pulse width and our frequency is going to stay at about 800, sorry, 800 um, pulses per second. And then last but not least, if we want to vigorously heat a patient, want to stretch the collagen, like let's say a patellar tendon, we want to lengthen that or Achilles tendon, we want to lengthen that then we need our pulse width to be at the max, which is about 400 microseconds. Um, and the frequency of that treatment is going to be about 800 pulses per second. Remember, I already said treatment time is going to be 20 minutes, regardless of the settings. So two key things that we need to manipulate, the pulse width and then the pulse rate. Hopefully that makes sense to you all. Um, that is diathermy uh, in a nutshell. Uh, thank you for listening to this online lecture. I really hope you learned something about diathermy.